for those joining us online. We'll be starting here in just a minute. Jim, would you lead our opening prayer? Sure. Yeah, good evening. Wonderful to be together. Midweek. For years and years, what do we call it? Midweek Bible study. It used to be called a prayer meeting, didn't it? I guess it used to be a big time for prayer sessions. Changed names over the years. Wednesday Bible study, Bible class. Um, <laughs> I don't know. What do we call it? I don't know. I don't have a bulletin. <laughs> Bible study. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16, the very end of the chapter tonight. I'm going to go ahead and read the, the few verses in just a moment, beginning at verse uh, 21, reading through verse 23. And then we'll sing a few verses of I gave my life for thee, and then we'll have a prayer. Jim's going to lead our first prayer, and then we'll get into our study. And I have a few special things to say at the very end about Ukraine and the work the church is doing. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, I'm going to say adversary. You are a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Is it not right for Peter to want to protect his master teacher, his friend? We're going to look out for you, Lord. We'll talk more about that as we get into it, but let's sing, I gave my life for thee. It's a four verse song and we're going to sing all four verses because of the message that is within that song. <clears throat> and hopefully I get the right tune. Peggy said the other day when I was kind of going over that I didn't have the right tune to begin with, so maybe I'll get it right. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou mightst ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell. A bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? I've borne, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? And I have brought to thee down from my home above salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me?
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for every blessing that you give us every day, Father. We thank you for this time that we have midweek to come to here in this building and study from your word. Father, I pray that we'll leave here um, uplifted and um, enthused about the things that your son did for us, Father. Uh, spread the good news every opportunity that we get. Father, I pray for my church family here. I pray especially for those that are on our list. I just pray that you bless each and every one of them as they stand in need. And Father, I pray also for those in Ukraine. We just pray, Father, that uh, you would bless them, keep them safe. And Father, we pray for the president of Russia that he will have a change of mind and that he will end that war there. Father, above all things, we just pray that your, your word will be preached and people will be saved. Father, I pray that you would forgive us of our sins and help us always to let your light shine. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Jesus predicts his death. And I was thinking just before we started, is that the right word? Predicts. Maybe not. Prophesied. Foretold, prophesied. I mean, it had been spoken of in the Old Testament. I'm working with a study book um, and, and other materials too, but I'm pretty sure the, the heading on this section was Jesus predicts his death. Now in the sense that he's telling them it's going to be. It's going to be. I'm going to die. Well, how is that? Go ahead. Revelation of Jesus' death, so he's speaking about it, revealing it to them. Uh, in this Bible here, it says Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. So he's speaking to his disciples, those real near to him, about what's going to be taking place soon. Now, how is that news? When we talked Sunday, we had, we had that slide. It's appointed unto man wants to die. Well, of course you're going to die. That's what happens. But this is a bit different, isn't it, what he said about it and, and the response he got, how he handled that. Matthew 16, 21, the very first part. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. From that time. He began to show. Think about that. What's the thought? He began to show. He began to tell them about it. He's going to begin to say some things about going to Jerusalem, why he must go there, what's going to happen there. This is the first announcement where he mentions his passion or that week and that time and that and, and and all this his emotion that's going to be put into the betrayal well even the uh, the night in the garden the betrayal the trials and all what he's going to go through on the cross he mentions his death kind of generally here then in Matthew chapter 17 and we'll go there in a second he adds his betrayal into the hands of sinners and then a third time, Matthew chapter 20, um, at length he expresses about the stripes and the cross things. So he just, he's building. So let's go to Matthew chapter 17 at verses uh, 22 to 23. And they were gathering in Galilee... As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Would you be? Yes. Your friend says, Death is imminent for me. 
and they were greatly distressed. Well, the Son of Man is about to be delivered to the hands of men, and they will kill him. But the disciples know who the, who's talking and why he's saying it. But it's a way of speaking. It's kind of indirect, isn't it? But they know who the Son of Man is. It's Jesus, and he's talking about himself. Yeah. I might have told you all about a friend, I'm not sure if I shared it in a class here or not, but I've shared it with different people about a, a real dear friend who used to live in, in Gainesville. He became a, a good friend down there, spent time with me. He'd go with, with me in nursing homes for teaching. Sometimes he'd fill in for me. He just, it's a great guy, but he had been battling cancer, three different cancers. And it just, it was a struggle. It finally, he finally, it finally got him. But, one day we had been out around doing some things and got back to the church building and and uh, I said, Jerry, I'm going to get my crown tomorrow. And he had tears to come into his eyes. What do you think he's thinking? The crown of life. He thought death. And I said, no, I'm going to the dentist and getting a crown. <laughs> It's going to be put in. But see, he's thinking yeah. about life and death because of where he is. And, and you think about the disciples. Oh, let's, go to, let's go to chapter 20 at verse 17. This is the third time that he, he mentions about his death. Chapter 20 at verse 17. And Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Now, that's a lot more detail, isn't it? And deliver him over to the Gentiles. That would be the Romans, the governor and the soldiers, to be mocked and flogged, and what? Crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. That's a lot of detail, isn't it? Did Jesus know what was going to happen? Very clearly he knew what was, what was going to take place. If you knew that some people were going to turn against you, come after you, and treat you so severely, torture you, and then put you to death, what would you do? We call it get out of dodge. Now, anybody that ends up listening in at another country may want to get out of dodge, and they're going to have to look that up. They're going to have to Google it. But you don't want to be shot down by your enemy. You want to get out. But Jesus three times says, I'm going to Jerusalem and they're going to kill me. He said, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Must. And I know the Passover was coming and everybody that's a Jewish, especially males and their, their families, they must go to Jerusalem. It's a requirement of God, but that's not why he's saying must, is it? I must go there and celebrate the Passover. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and, came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. This is in Luke chapter 13 at verse 31. They're telling Jesus to get out of Galilee. Get out of town. Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons, perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. He's not going to get me in Galilee. You know, it's something that a bit of time later, 
Jesus is going to be arrested after the betrayal, taken in Jerusalem for trial of the Sanhedrin with the high priest and all, taken before Pilate. Pilate's going to find out, oh, Jesus is from Galilee? Oh, that's not my jurisdiction. And Herod happens to be in town. Let him go over to Herod. And Herod got to meet Jesus, the one who at one time wanted to kill him, it seemed. At least the Pharisees said so. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the third day. I've got work to do here, and then I must be headed on to Jerusalem because it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. This prophet, the greatest prophet ever, the Son of God, I've got to go to Jerusalem. That's where I must, what? Die. What was going to take place at Jerusalem was within the divine plan from before the beginning of the world. And Jesus could not avoid it, would not avoid it, and he would not deny it. We sing the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. But he... He had a must in his life. I must do this. So from that day forward, we have three recordings in Matthew of when he spoke to them about this. How much else he said, I don't know. But he began to reveal to them what the plan was from the beginning in his coming. Verse 21b and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. I must go downtown into the alleyway and get beat up by some thugs. And you go, are you crazy, Bob? Why would you go to Atlanta into an alleyway where you know there's going to be a group there that will beat you up? You would say, you must not. And I would probably say, I don't want to. But Jesus had to. And he knew, what, he knew how they were turning on him. Shane? Didn't run from the problem. He had to face it. It was a plan. I mean, he was a part of that plan from the very beginning. And when he came to this earth, that was the plan. When it said, must go to Jerusalem, that's all co so connected to the must also uh, is a, a, a suffer, the suffering and the death, expected, anticipated. He knew it was going to happen. He must. Matthew 26 at 59 through 60. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus. Judas has betrayed him. They've taken him from the garden, taken him in Jerusalem. It's early morning. It's dark. The whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus. Now, why would they have to seek false testimony? What? Because there wasn't any true testimony against him, was there? He had not done anything wrong. So we got to have false witnesses, false testimony. By the way, I've got my little packet that I keep my hearing aids in, and the hearing aids are on a little shelf next to my chair at home. So <laughs> if I say, what? <laughs> the chief priest and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many, what kind of witnesses? False witnesses came forward. So they had arranged, maybe already paid them or whatever, arranged for false witnesses to come in, and they couldn't even get it straight, and they were conflicting in what they were saying, and it just wasn't going to hold up in a court of law, much less their miscarriage of judgment. Uh, Matthew 26 and 67, you talk about suffering, they spit in his face and struck him and some slapped him. How would you like that? You ever been slapped? 
Okay, I got one head going down. Oh, here's another one. Huh? You might have done the slapping. People don't necessarily like to be slapped, do they? A girl slapped me one time. We were standing around on the front porch of the church building, Panama Street in Montgomery, and, and, uh, and we were talking, and, and I don't know what was said, and I said something, I guess because she had lived most of her life in Thailand, although she was not Thai, um, she didn't quite get my joking, and I got a slap. And it was nothing rude or crude or anything like that, but she didn't appreciate it. I got slapped. Nobody else would have, but it didn't feel good. And then she might have been flirting. I don't know. Sorry, Peggy. <laughs> But think about what they did to Jesus. He said, I've got to suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. False witnesses spit in his face, struck him, slapped him. When morning came, Matthew 27, 1, when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him. Did they need to bind him? Was well, he going to run away? No. But he's a criminal. No. They bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Now, why did they have to do that? There's a technical reason. They had to take him to the Roman governor. There was something they didn't have the right to do, although they did it sometime. Capital punishment. They couldn't condemn him to death. I mean, they could condemn him as such, but they couldn't carry it out without the Roman government allowing it. And so, well, let's go to Pilate. But they bound him, and he hasn't had anything to eat or drink or whatever, and, it's, and I guess like the sun's beginning to rise or whatever, and let's take him over to Pilate's place. Matthew 27 and verse 20, Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas, and destroy Jesus. Okay, who was Barabbas? He was a true criminal. Terrible insurrection, all kind of the whatever. He was a terrible man. You free Barabbas and, and, and you kill Jesus. What do you want me to do with Jesus? And what'd they say? <laughs> crucify him, crucify him. We want his death. The chief priests, the elders, those people, they were behind the mob and what they said and what they did. They were leading that. And Jesus knew early on what he's telling his disciples here. Here's what's going to happen when I get to Jerusalem. And I must go there, and it's going to happen. Matthew 21, the latter part of that verse. And be killed, and on the third day be raised. They're going to treat me terribly, and they're going to kill me. But on the third day, I'll be raised. So what's that say to them? He won't stay dead, will he? Luke 24, 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? He's walking along the road to Emmaus with two people. When did that happen? After. After the death, the burial, the resurrection, and they're saying, well, we got a report that Jesus was not in the tomb anymore, and some say they saw him or whatever. Don't you get it, people? Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. It was necessary, he says, must. The Christ had to suffer and enter into his glory. He had to be crucified. Luke 24 and 44, a little later, he's now with his, um, his um, chosen disciples, the ones that become his apostles. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Oh, well, what we just got through reading in the beginning of this verse. I must go to Jerusalem because something's got to happen. He began to tell them these things. He says, don't you remember what I told you? All the things written in the law and the prophets about me and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day 
rise from the dead. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning from where? Jerusalem. So it had long been spoken. Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. That gets the Old Testament, doesn't it? That the Messiah, the coming Messiah, the Christ, had to suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And the suffering would include death. Or otherwise there wouldn't be any resurrection. <clears throat> but it has purpose, doesn't it? That repentance and remission or forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name. The authority of Jesus to all nations. I don't think they understood who he was. It took them a while, didn't it? But it's like we're in a class and the teacher begins to reveal things, begins to teach us, and we don't quite get it yet. And as it goes along, finally it's, it begins to click or we kind of light, a light comes on up here and, and a little bit later it gets a little brighter. By the day of Pentecost, they're ready to give their lives for Jesus. Well, they were expecting an earthly They were expecting an earthly kingdom and Jesus, well, that's why the scribes and the Pharisees didn't like him because he wasn't one of them and giving them what they wanted. So they wanted him dead. God knew it would be that way. And his disciples struggled with it, but they finally came to understand that what happened was a must, but he told them beforehand. He prepared them for it. Yeah. It's like bringing the family in and you're on your deathbed and you talk to them about what's going to happen and what they're to do afterwards and all. Um, verse 22. Yes, Gerald. <clears throat> And this was in business ethics. Ten or twelve points that he had mm -hmm. that he addressed the entire class. And, and he, his major point was, what good does it do us to have laws if we're not going to obey them? So, it was a tremendous class. But one other point I'd like to make, when yeah. you think about the prayer uh, in Gethsemane that Jesus offered and the intensity of it and how he as it were, drops of blood. You know, we sometimes think, well, he knew he was going to be killed. Well, he knew that too. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just quite possible. He knew every aspect of what he was going to have to go through. The mocking, the spit upon, the blasphemy, every accusation that was going to be made against him. And it just seems that is probably a bigger load for him to think about than just dying. That all these people that he had tried to help and miracles and all this, all of them turning against him. And, and uh, that felt sort of had a yeah. lot to do with the trauma that he yeah. experienced. Wait, we take that phrase, the son of man. He's in the flesh. Yeah. He knows what his body's going to go. It's like us maybe thinking about, well, I'm getting ready to have a surgery. And they've described some things about that surgery. And it might bring more trauma. <laughs> you know, I can remember laying in the hospital before my open heart, and there was these videos and all. I was supposed to get on the TV and watch. And what it would be like afterwards and all. And they were all old, decrepit people that looked like they were half dead anyway. And I'm thinking, is that what it's going to be like after the surgery? I didn't really dread the surgery so much because I thought, well, this is supposed to keep me alive. But... But Jesus knew what was going to happen. And, and, and that thing, I've, seen, I've heard lessons and read things about the trial and how they violated all of their, their statutes. And like you say, what good is a law if you're not going to use it? Well, they didn't care because they wanted their power and their, their prestige or whatever their positions. And Jesus was getting in the way. And they'd do anything to take him out of the way. Yeah. And that's the guilt of sin. Oh. All the sins that are weighing on him mm -hmm. had to be very, very emotional for him. Uh, 
He knew why he was going to the cross. He hadn't done anything wrong. Mankind had. And he's witnessed it from heaven. Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, when Abraham told a lie. I mean, he's a good man, but he had David. But you think about some of the others that, that were there, the, the kings and all, that were so evil, and he's, he, know, he saw every bit of that and knew that's why he was dying. That's a good point about the suffering. He would also be separated from God. Separated from his Father in heaven, from God. I mean, he's God in the flesh, but there's another part of God there. And so there's a lot in his mind even before the garden. And he's beginning to tell his apostles about it. In verse 22, and Peter took him aside. Well, that's kind of a good idea. And began to rebuke him. Saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. I am going to Jerusalem and I am going to um, be put to death. I'm going to be killed and on the third day raised. And all Peter gets is, I'm going to Jerusalem to be killed. Lord, this isn't right. We're not going to let it happen. I'm not going to. Was Peter always outspoken? He just always just jumped up there on the soapbox and opened his mouth. He's the one who pulled the sword in the garden and cut Malchus's ear off, the servant's ear off, the high priest servant. And Jesus already told him, no, you're not going to protect me. And he had to get on to him then and picked up that ear and put it back on the fellow. And that's a kind of a sign. If I wanted to do something, I could do it. But Peter, put your sword away. John 18 and verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus, John tells us. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your short sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? It's like, I've already told you, Peter, I have to do this. That's what we're going to read next. Peter's profession was what? A fisherman. When you catch fish and you're going to prepare it for your own grill or to sell in a marketplace, what are you going to do? What do you got to do with that fish? Clean it up. Cut it open. Take out the intestines, all the stuff inside that needs to be out. That, won't, that would otherwise harm the meat and all. You gotta, and those fishermen had to do that when they brought in a catch. They had servants, Peter and Andrew and James and John worked with them some, whatever, they had family businesses and they had servants that helped them out. But he had a good sized knife for cleaning those fish. <laughs> I could say gutting them or whatever. I mean, he was gonna protect Jesus. Put your sword away, Peter. When Jesus earlier said must, what did he mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Peter, you're trying to stop it. And I must do this. So we go to the next verse. But he turned, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. Was Peter the devil? Was Peter Satan? It's the meaning of the word there. Adversary. Opponent. Peter, you're in a sense standing in my way. It's nice to have somebody to want to defend you, but sometimes you just got to do something. It's your business. You got to take care of it. Let me just take care of it for you. Peter, you're going to be standing in my way. And he tried in the garden to do it. And Jesus had to stop him there. Devil means accuser. Satan means adversary or opponent. But if you were to turn over to the book of Job, you would find that Satan came before God and talked about Job and tried to make accusations about him. So there you see him as Satan, an adversary, and the devil, an accuser. 
And that's why those two names get attached to that being. He's an adversary, an opponent, and he's also an accuser. He wants to accuse us before God for things, but who's going to be our lawyer, our advocate, Jesus? And he's going to turn Satan away and say, Father, this is one of mine. Come on in. And Satan's going to go, but, 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 but. It's all lies, Satan. I've already taken care of that. They're not in sin. They're not under condemnation. Don't you get it, Satan? But he doesn't, he wishes not. But Peter, you're, you're being an adversary. You know, Job was blameless and upright. Satan's looking for something, something to say. Jesus had purpose. But Peter wanted to protect him. Does that, that make sense, doesn't it? Would you probably want to protect your teacher? Someone you, you care about, you're close to. And you don't want anybody to hurt them. But Jesus says, I got to do this. I got to do this. Don't get in my way, Peter. I have to head for Jerusalem and don't you hinder me. And so he makes the statement, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Well, that makes sense. Peter's in the flesh. He's a human being. He loves Jesus. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Tend my sheep. You know, that's all going to come up later. Uh, Peter has, has grown close to Jesus. But he's thinking like a man. And that's to be expected. But see, God has some things in mind. God has a plan. And Peter, you, you can't stop that. Uh, you're not setting your mind or... King James says, savorest not. Barnes says, your language and spirit are not such as spring from the supreme regard to the will of God. So Jesus is later after the fact of death, burial, and resurrection going to open their minds to the scriptures that God had said, what is it, Isaiah 53, the suffering Savior? We read that chapter and parts of it sometimes at the Lord's Supper. David talked about it. God had a plan. He had a supreme plan. And Peter didn't get it yet. If I'd been there, I wouldn't have either. We can kind of get it. Why? Because we've already read it all. Yeah. We've got, what did Paul Harvey say the rest of the story? Say, we, we've heard it all, but Peter had not yet. And the things of the Old Testament, all those things didn't quite fit. And Jesus is slowly but surely revealing those things. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, The natural person does not ac accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And there are people in the world just don't get what the church is all about or what Jesus is all about without some help. They don't, understand, they don't understand what our life is about. And maybe they'll stand in opposition to us because they don't understand. And right now, Peter is not really getting. What is your purpose, Jesus? I love having you as a teacher. You're a good friend. And you feed us. You heal the sick. You do all these wonderful things. And I just want to have you around for a long time. And Jesus said, I can't be, not on earth. And he's going to get it later. Romans chapter 8 at verse 5, beginning. Romans chapter 8 at verse 5. Eight, Romans 8, verse 5. Let me find my place here. A little bit of letters. There you go. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. Well, does that make sense? Get a job, earn money, buy stuff. Set aside some for later. Take care of myself because this is all I got. This is it. That's life. Get trained, get an education, whatever. Get a student loan. 
What's the things of the, of the earth, of the flesh? But those who live according to the Spirit set their, th their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. That's all it brings is death. You accomplish so much, and then what happens? You die, and all that you've done is left to somebody else. Solomon talks about that. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Peter, you're an adversary. You're trying to stop God's plan. Peter hadn't picked up on it yet. Don't be an adversary to God. He's got a plan. Well, I don't like God's plan. Or I think I'm wise. Because we're thinking fleshly. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. I don't understand. What, there are things in the law that even in our courts they argue about, don't they? I heard a good thing the other day, and I don't really want to get into much of this, but uh, there was some discussion about gender. God made two sexes. Gender is... It gave some explanation of what gender came from. You look up the etymology or whatever and follow that out. And so it's just a, a use of a term that doesn't strictly really apply to what we're really talking about. And if we use the real terms, you know, it would, it would answer some things. But hostile to God does not submit to God. Because my mind's set on the flesh. And I want fleshly things. And we want our way. And we don't like God's way. It can't understand God or, 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 or it come into line. Indeed, it cannot. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. Because they're only thinking fleshly. And God gets in their way, doesn't he? I want to do this and I want to do it my way. And you tell me I can't do that. You tell me that's a sin. And, and I want to have pleasure. I want to be happy. I want this. I want that. And don't you get in my way of all that. And especially not with your God or your Jesus. <laughs> now, Peter learned better, didn't he? Because he thought he was doing right. Well, we're not going to let anything hurt you, anybody hurt you. We're not going to let that happen to you, Jesus. We'll protect you. I'll pull out my trusty case knife and we'll... And Jesus, no, no, I must do this. You don't get it, Peter. And it took the death, burial, and resurrection for Peter to finally get it. See, it's easy for us now. We have the Bible. Yeah. With all the truth. Back then, they didn't have anything. They didn't know what all was going to happen. They had no clue. Well, the prophets had spoken, but they didn't get it. And they had to finally come to an understanding. But even today, with us knowing that, do we not struggle with it sometime? Right. He was accomplishing the will of his father. He was. Right. He was, yeah. And that involved an awful lot compared to, I mean, he probably talked to us about laying down your life for someone you love and mm -hmm. someone you know, but he was doing a much harder uh, situation than that. And they didn't have a, they struggled with a sin that, mm -hmm. that it was God's will. Wouldn't you agree that it's, it takes more than just intellectually understanding that. I read it. The preacher said it. I saw the outline. So intellectually, I get it that Jesus had to die. But then what do we do with it? How does it impact our lives? The must that he put upon us, are we, let's see, what did it say about them? Um, find my place here. So the flesh cannot please God. Back up, they didn't submit to God. They were hostile to God. And we may need to make sure that in our decisions, our daily lives and all, that we're not hostile to God. God, I know you said this, but I really think, or whatever. We get to thinking, uh, and, and, and here we go. Um, well, let's stop there and sing about it.
I serve a risen Savior. Is he in the world today? Yeah. Spiritually speaking, he dwells in us and his church. I know that he is living no matter what men may say. They killed him. He's dead. I don't believe he ever was. Well, that's your problem, and you need to work on that. Maybe I can help you with that, but all right. Um, we're going to sing the first and the third verses of this. We'll refrains on the next slide. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. <clears throat> but high for me, we'll go on. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him. The help of all who find. <clears throat> None other is so loving so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. It took Peter and the other disciples a while to, fight, to take it to heart. And look at what they were willing to do when they finally took it to heart and got the idea of who Jesus really was and what his purpose was. Sunday we're going to be looking at one Lord Overall, that is a picture in Kathmandu with, uh, well, that's not actually the Himalayas behind. Way back over, I can see a ridge that's part of the Himalayas, but not too far from there are the Himalaya Mountains. One Lord, and there are people there that don't understand that. There are those who do, but many who don't. We'll look at that Sunday. A message concerning Ukraine. A lot that we could say, but just uh, there is an opportunity that we can take a hold of. Peg and I will later this evening. The Meridianville Church of Christ in Meridianville, Alabama. You ever heard of it? Maybe not. No. John Cackleman, who at the present is uh, living in Montgomery, attends the Del Raider Church of Christ there. He will be talking about his trip. Well, already has. It was started. Well, it was starting at 6:30 at Meridianville, their Wednesday evening service. Uh, he was talking about his trip to Poland and the relief efforts that have been going on. He's been in the midst of this of the, uh, so many shipments going over, going over to uh, uh, check on some of the things. It is a rare opportunity, they say, to hear from someone who has been to Poland and worked firsthand helping the Ukrainian refugees. He's going to be making a report. Uh, you can find their Facebook page, Meridianville Church of Christ in Alabama. You can find their face, a Facebook page, and you can also find them on YouTube. And uh, what he has done there or is doing, out of the time difference and all, uh, it will be recorded just like ours, Shane, right? It's there. It'll be available after the fact for us to watch. Uh, they met at 6.30 their time, 7.30 our time. Um, but we can view the recorded message. 
I bring up John Cackleman. Um, I've got one or two books or so, or some study things that he did a number of years ago. And I've, I think I've heard him speak and all. I didn't know he was in Montgomery until all this Ukraine stuff started and started seeing how they were a part of all the efforts to get things together and shipped over there, people donating, and um, um, just, just so much going on. But I have to mention Peggy. Is that okay? Brag on Peggy a little bit. Uh, she's been in touch with a number of refugees in different countries. And, well, uh, contact with some within Ukraine. But through John Cackleman, working with him, they've been instrumental in the procurement of some body armor. We know what that is, don't we? We're not sure of the number yet. Uh, found out uh, just yesterday or so that it's a larger group of men than we thought it was. Members of the church. They cannot leave Ukraine. But they are going into those areas that are under attack, like vans, vehicles, and getting sisters, their kids, not their sisters in Christ, others, but and the, and the children and all, older people, and transporting them to Poland. They've gotten permission to go across the border to drop them off, and they go right back. And so, what I'm sister-in-law appealed for body armor. And Peggy put some messages out there, and John Cackleman responded, and body armor is on the way. Maybe already in Ukraine, maybe in Kiev, we're not certain exactly where it is, but there's some contact being made for those men to get it, and hopefully they'll get it and be able to appeal for extra uh, body armor, because I think it's somewhere around 12 or 14 men brothers in Christ, that are doing it, risking this. Huh? We know they're getting two, because we knew of him and another one with him, and then came, got a, ended up getting a picture of a larger group that is doing the work. So they're, they're doing their own convoys to get people out. And they're, they're under threat like anyone. And so they're trying to at least keep them a little safer as they're transporting. But isn't it a wonderful how the Christ and his church comes together? People half, halfway around the world, you don't really know, and you begin to get to know people, and, and connections are made. Yeah, they bring them across the border, and there are Christians, Poland, Romania, other places that have opened up their homes. Even in the United States and Canada and other places have opened up their homes, and, uh, and then they are able to make contact because they have an area they, they go and can make contact from there to get them safe locations, places where they can have a roof over their head for the, their children, and, and where they can, they work to get them jobs, something to do to, to earn an income. Where they can't, they do what they can to help them until something comes along. But it's just amazing what all is going on. It's just amazing what's going on. And, you know, governments do things, but when you get Christians involved, and they just do it, you know, they got to work a little bit through governments and all, but they just get in there and do. There's not a lot of red tape. I wonder how long it would have taken to get the body armor in there if we uh, had appealed to the government for it. I don't know. Maybe they are taking some in. I don't know. But what a blessing it is. Look forward to being with all of you and many more on Sunday. Thank you for those that have joined us uh, live stream, others that will see the recording later. Uh, just pray that uh, we learn, we're uplifted, looking at Jesus. If he is willing to risk it all, what about us? Does he call on us to risk it all? This world is not my home. I'm just, I'm just a passing through. I thought this evening with the songs that we were singing I wonder if people in another nation, as they're trying to translate it out, know what some of those words mean, where we put a little hyphenation in there and shorten the word. And, but I guess they can figure it out in context. Sometimes we don't think about that in communicating with people other places. But thankful for the technology where Peggy can write somebody, maybe even talk, and Google or a computer translates 
and she made a phone call and, uh, and to Poland, and she said, I know she at least understood Facebook because she was trying to get her to go to Facebook and look because she had sent her a message of making communication, getting some connections made, and she understood that word, Facebook. It's just amazing the technology we have today that can bring people together, um, even as confusing as it can be. Jim? It will translate because I've had things to come through and I'm thinking I don't know what that says because it wasn't translated but they have I've even uh, they even will send messages out along with something like that saying <clears throat> rate the translation and other words, could you understand what they were saying from the way it was translated they typed it in or spoke it in one way. How did it come across? And so you can rate it so it helps them to improve. What a world we live in. Isn't it amazing? The Tower of Bible confused the language. Yeah. Facebook puts us all back together. As a matter of speaking, which it does. I know Henry, oh, they're not here tonight. Henry likes to bring up, you know, we have the Tower of Bible confused the language. You get to Pentecost. And God had a way to bring, all, bring it all back together again so they could understand. I guess to Peggy's point, let's don't leave God out of Facebook. Don't leave God out of Facebook. Yeah. I mean, did God have a plan? Well, he can use anything. Now all we got to do is just jump in there and trust him. Aaron's going to lead us. Uh, glad to have you back, Aaron, from your trip. Hope you got some rest. I was going to call you and ask something about your business, but no, I decided no, I won't, I won't bother you with that. But I'm glad to have him back. He's going to lead us in prayer. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening, and just uh, hope it goes well for you the rest of the week. Pray with me. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you for letting us be here in peace, to meet and to study your word, to be together, to enjoy each other's fellowship. Father, we now ask you for blessings upon the people of Ukraine. Father, we ask you to prick the heart of Putin, help him to change his mind about this war, to end it as soon as possible. Father, help us to find ways to help fellow Christians in the Ukraine. Help us to dig down deep and figure out what we can do because it's through you, Father, that we are able to do anything on this earth. It's you, Father, who give us the blessings that we have. It's you, Father, who give us the breath of this life. Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. We, Father, we, so many times we fail to follow your word and your will for our lives. But we thank you for Jesus, who died for us, that we may have life in you, and in him. Father, as we go out tonight, help us to remember you and your son in everything we do. Help us to be of the spirit and not of the flesh. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.